Okay, I did tell Stan that I kind of was probably the person that knew least about security in the room, so uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, so I'm trying to distill this down to the ugly truth, which is, for me, quite simple. As a designer, you have to find all the flaws in a system and the attacker only one. And the one takeaway I'd like to give from this talk, I think, is you will fail. And you have to plan for that failure because whatever system you build, they're all hackable and you have to base on the assumption that you're going to fail. So I think that's the, the one key takeaway for me for today. And we've all talked about IoT, how people are going to make money out of it, how that's all typically in the data and a lot of you talked about theft of data and what happens to that. But you can only trust the big data if you actually trust the little data, which is all about trusting the device. And undoubtedly, security is in the kind of the top three list of things that will affect what the adoption rate of IoT is. And with IoT, I genuinely believe we're talking about billions of devices in deployment. And so with that sort of scale, it is all about reducing the attack surface on any one individual item. And next thing I think is slightly controversial, it's not what some of the earlier speakers have said. I believe this applies to all sensors. Even if it's simple sensors that have no valuable data and you don't think there are any privacy issues. I don't think security can be made an optional item. And I'll come back to it. We, this is not the PC age. It's not the mobile age. It's IoT. Security needs to be architected from the beginning and cannot be made an option. And right now, it tends to be offered as a cost option. If you want to, you can add it. And uh, I firmly believe it's something that really needs to be designed in from the beginning, regardless of the system. And I believe that is entirely achievable from a kind of cost, power, budget perspective. So we talked about various systems that are being hacked. And if you look at most of the embedded software development, it's traditionally not being connected. It's a closed system with a lot of pro, uh, proprietary software built on top of a little, 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 little RTOS. And we now live in a world where we need to care about security, but very few developers have any real understanding of it. And the only way I think to address that is to kind of change the balance of things and actually say, we're going to provide a lot of security for you so you don't need to worry about it. We're going to tell you and then make it easy for you to use best practice, not for you to have to go and read up about it and discover how you should do things. It should actually be there from the beginning. And I think that change is a change that has to come about in how people develop software and systems for IoT devices because we cannot take all of the software community and turn them into security experts. It's not going to work. And I think it is too easy to blame those designers who get it wrong, partly because they're not security experts, they're not going to be. Even if they're trying to be, it's one of those things that's really hard to measure in a system and therefore tends to get compromised as project schedules and costs drive out those optional, optional factors. And then you're faced with the fact that you've got this kind of parallel hacking world against a tiny community of de developers. So I, I don't think it's a question of blaming the developers. It's a question of finding ways to make it easy for them to build secure systems. And we various talkers touched on this. You know, security is dynamic over the lifetime of a product, either because as it moves down the value chain, your concerns about what gets hacked and what the value is changes from the manufacturer who may not care through to an end user who really does, or quite possibly a service provider who actually cares about it more than anyone else in the value chain, and how actually over the whole lifetime of the product, once it's in the field, the value can change. And we need to address that so that choices at the beginning don't affect the, the security that happens at the end. So again, you have to start at the beginning. And there's a whole new class of attacks out there. Everyone talks about denial of service attacks, but when I come back to some of the low-cost sensors, um, you know, new DOS attack is actually, all it does is flatten the battery of your device. Right? It's a new attack on a system, and you know, for that reason, if your product is successful, it is going to be hacked. 
And you know, the costs at the moment of deploying new firmware updates often you know, could be larger than the cost of the original device. And you, know, you may have a sensor that is installed in the fabric of the building with a 20-year battery life. You may not be able to get to it. Replacing that battery might actually be really expensive. And we are not living in a PC world. In the PC world, when it does go wrong, you restart the device because you can push the button. When it goes wrong, you get somebody in to actually take the hard drive out, re re rebuild your hard drive, and put your machine back on again. You can't do that with an IoT device. And so you're talking about these systems which you do not necessarily have physical access to. And coming back to that cheap little sensor, that cheap little sensor, if it's running off a battery and I've flattened it and it's in the fabric, you really need to worry about it. You need to be able to protect that happening. So, oh, this flicker seems to be a bit iffy. You have to build systems on the assumption that you're going to get hacked. And because of that, you have to be able to reflash them. Now, quite a lot of people talked earlier about what happens when people steal the data. I'm less worried about the data being stolen. I'm actually worried that the device is stolen. Because if you lose control of the, an IoT device, it's game over. Loss of the data, I think, is something that's actually easier to protect than loss of the device. And that, again, is a difference between the PC world, the phone world, and actually IoT. It's all about actually keeping control of those devices. So fundamental for me on this, and they talked about Red Bend earlier, how do you control and manage firmware updates is actually a critical part of what you make IoT devices and how you make them scale. But it's actually a system challenge because you've got to talk about you know, the lifetime security of the device, the communication protocols and how you secure those, and then right at the bottom of that, device security itself. And you need to worry about all of those things. It's not just about devices. It's devices, communications, and the lifetime of the services that are provided on it. Now, of course, coming from ARM, I'm peddling you to a solution to those problems. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. But you know, I, I believe there is a role for a different OS at the bottom to actually handle all of these issues for small, low-power constrained devices. I think there is software that you need to run in the cloud that works with them and manages it. However, it all has to be built around open standards. This is not a world where proprietary protocols, proprietary lock-ins for how you do updates is going to work. It all has to be built on open standards. And finally, I don't believe there is any money in end client devices. So the bottom end of that stack, open source, software, it's free, give it away, have security people crawl all over it, do what you want with it. Um, it's not an area where you can make money. And I think as, in general, products go from being dumb products to products enabled with service, value goes to that service. It puts the hardware costs and the software, embedded software costs under tight control. There isn't money there. That's where all the margins being squeezed out. So we're kind of happy with that. Give it up. Give it away for free. That's the only way to enable some of the changes that I think need to happen to actually make this a secure world. And I think as an industry, we have a responsibility to actually make it a secure world because the PC is pretty hopeless. The phone only really works because it's a fairly closed ecosystem. With IoT, we actually have the opportunity of rebuilding this better from the ground up. So a little bit about device security. Classic device, we've seen some of them here today, have this kind of flat uh, address space view of the world. It's a microcontroller. It's not particularly sophisticated. But within that, you need to make the secure components work. If you're doing it right, you've got unclonable device IDs. You're doing crypto and random number generation. But you know, I have learned too much in the last year about what do you need to do to have good entropy pools for random number generation across hard reset, right? Because it's all about what happens when the hacker comes out, and as you said, you get the blowtorch out and you force the device to reset. You need an entropy pool that is preserved across that kind of attack. Otherwise, your crypto is not going to be that good. But how do I make that so that somebody can find those easy to use? So you've got all of these difficult components and everything lives in this flat, secure world. And you end up with a very large attack surface, 
which somebody is going to find a hole in. And once they find that hole, wherever it is, you can probably reflash the machine. And at that point, as I say, you've lost control of your device. So any security flaw in that whole complex world, developed by people who don't necessarily know what they're doing as a, as a, as a full-time job, results in you potentially losing control of your device. It's the wrong way to architect things. You have to rebuild the world into those things that are truly secure and those things that don't need to be. You need to split memory, you need to split execution into those two different worlds. You need to make the footprint of the stuff on the right as small as you can so you can invest a lot of time, effort, expertise in getting it right. You must never let protected keys out of the right-hand side into the left-hand side of the world. You have to provide the APIs that says these are the functions you're allowed to perform on trusted assets, but never let people get their hands on the trusted assets themselves. And to do that, you need to provide hardware support underneath the software to make that work. And you need to do it in tiny, tiny microcontrollers. So this isn't a large system with virtual memory protection. You have to make this work in embedded microcontrollers. And if you do that, you can reduce what the attack surface is for an attacker coming in. And with that, you can make sure that people can't write directly to Flash, that you can't recover clean data. And then hopefully, if there is a flaw in the device on the left-hand side, you can securely reflash it. And that's kind of an important part, is how do you get yourself back once you've been attacked, and you hope the flaws are in the left-hand side, not in the right-hand side. So why do this? And a lot of this is about fast innovation. You want the doll maker to make their doll. You want them to bring out a new doll next day, the day after that, the day after that. You want them to be able to iterate products quickly and do fast development. Stuff on the right-hand side, you want it to be slow, steady, measured, reviewed, and of high, high quality, and it doesn't change a lot. If there's a flaw there, the cost is really high, but you're minimizing that attack surface to some place that is slow and stable and not iterated quickly by people who are effectively product hackers who want to get a product shipped out the door in a week, who've subcontracted all of the design to somebody who's subcontracted it to somebody else who finally actually employs a 16-year-old who does it. You need to actually separate those two worlds, and it is about enabling fast innovation. So, if we look at security profiles, most of what we do is about stopping people attacking some large network set of devices. So, modest amounts of atta effort into attacking that device, modest amount of effort into protecting that device. What you can do in a lab with a device is much, much harder, right? You can spend an awful lot more effort to actually crack a device in the lab, and therefore, if you're going to protect it, you have to spend an awful lot more of effort to protect it. And you then need to design your system, am I actually going to be resistant to that lab attack? Now, if you're doing a smart card or a SIM card, you may well decide that you want to make it resist those kinds of very, very intensive lab attacks. But you also have to look at your security architecture. You know, if the cost of hacking one device unlocks many devices, then you really have to try hard. Because the worst thing is you take one DVD player and you discover that, gosh, the encryption is there is symmetric. If I crack this one DVD player, I can unlock all DVDs in the world. Now, who designed a system like that? <laughs> right? Okay, but if that's the system you want to build, you better make sure you resist that. So, you know, symmetric crypto is great for lightweight, low-cost communication encryption once you've established unique security encryption. So, again, it's, you need to know how to architect your system. And those lab attacks can only pre be prevented ultimately with cores that actually have tamper-resistant circuitry in it. You know, we do a whole development of CPUs just for that. 
It's done in labs that don't have any network connections to them, right? They're in, not lead-lined, but foiled-lined development rooms. The documentation for it doesn't leave that room unless it's encrypted, and it does lots of things to kind of do random execution so that if you're actually trying to do your side channel attack analysis, you don't really know what code it's running because some of the code execution is random. The bits get arbitrary scrambled dynamically with time. An awful lot of effort put into how you make it resist that. That is a level of protection you probably can't afford for every device you do, but then make sure that the devices that are going to be hacked in the field, if I hack the device, I've hacked one device. I haven't liberated keys that actually unlock multiple devices. So I think you know, we're going to see device-specific keys and an explosion in those device-specific keys because you need to make them individually hackable rather than collectively hackable. So you've got to work out where you fit, what your attack is, and how you're going to design it. So we had some talk about cars and um, how secure are they. Um, and again, you look at them and they're not. But let's just pretend that your car really is secure. My question is kind of is, you know, how safe is it? And we all know that uh, people are adding in all of these different cameras, sensors, radar, in order to be able to move us from level zero, which has no autonomous, through these defined up to level four full autonomous driving. You know, this is coming. The world is going to look like this, and we will have autonomous cars, and there is a roadmap for that development. And the question is, is it safe? Well, you can worry about, are the algorithms safe, and you know, how well did we uh, write the software, and what are the moral issues of, do I kill the occupant of the car, do I kill the baby in the pram? All of those issues will need to get resolved. You're laughing, but you know, which the car knows, it's got a choice. I drive off the road, I drive into the pram, what do I do? Um, all of those issues need to get resolved. But what's already clear and has come out of the automotive industry is if you want to make systems that are safe, you have to change the way you do engineering. So again, the cores that go into automotive have different engineering practice than some of our cores that are just done for mobile phones. You need to have completely different levels of documentation, uh, verification, validation of those cores. You have to provide all of those materials, work out what the failure mode analyses are, meet much tougher engineering standards for how you just design the hardware. Before you get to worrying about those, the, the, those algorithms, the fundamental way you design the products needs to be different if you're actually going to convince people that you're going to end up with a safe product. So even if it's secure, you have to ask if it's safe. And I think if you look into the future, you know, what people are doing in automotive today may well be what we need to do in IoT in the future. So while everything in IoT may well be cheap and cheerful, parts of that will slowly migrate and as people become more and more concerned about larger scale deployments, you'll see actually the requirements all the way from the bottom up for a higher quality of engineering associated with those product developments. And then you get into the whole question of how do you validate the software that goes on top of that. So this is a spectrum, and as they say with security, you, know, you can spend as much money as you like on the problem, I fundamentally believe we have to move the bar significantly that with IoT we start from a much better place than we ever have done in, 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 in PC or the mobile phone industry. But even once you've moved to what I think is the bare minimum we are responsible for, there is then a big continuum ahead of us of how much more we may need to invest. So, a little bit about comms security, and I'm going to disagree with some people here. I believe in IP to the edge, right? I really believe we should be doing internet protocols to the edge. There are subsets of them. There are simplifications through DTLS and co-app. It may not be full TLS stack, but I believe you can do that to the edge. I also believe you need to trust in Moore's law. I can look at it and see the microcontrollers you can buy today, you'll be able to buy tomorrow, that give you the memory footprint and the CPU power to run IP to the edge with no excuses. It's well less than a dollar in any sensible volume to buy those chips. Yes, there's 
old generation 8-bit microcontrollers, but if you're looking at new designs, I really believe you can do IP to the edge. It is internet to the edge. And other people said, yeah, well, your devices might not all be out there on the internet. True, but you should damn well assume that they are. You should have architected it, I think, as IP to the edge. You may well have local routers that mean your traffic never actually gets onto the internet because you're running it on a private network. You may well have local gateways that are where you do your firewalling and your protection. But protocol-wise, it's IP to the edge. Your device itself may not be connected to the, to, 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 to the internet. You may rely on a proxy. So my phone is going to unlock my front door. My front door is not connected to the internet. It's only got Bluetooth to my phone. I give a certificate for my front door to my friend, and I go, it's a week old. It's, it only lasts for a month. I may want to do revocation of that certificate. The door can't get to the internet. But my phone can, my friend's phone can. When my friend's phone comes and says, I'd like to unlock your door, it's probably that phone app's responsibility to go, I will now offer you internet service so you can go online and check whether the certificate I'm issuing you has been revoked or not. And if you don't actually give me that access and I don't get commu secure communication channel through to the web, I'm not going to unlock my door because I don't know if your certificate is valid or not and whether it's on, on the revocation list. So even devices themselves that don't have the power to get to the internet, you can architect as though they can. You can build systems where they can. And if you don't put IP to the edge in at the bottom, you're never going to add it afterwards. So I really do believe in IP to the edge for all devices, and then you architect your system and maybe say, my system doesn't need it, it lives in a cloud box. But don't then go, oh, well, you know what, I'm going to back off on the security, I'm not going to bother with TLSL, I'm not going to put any encryption on my link layer. Not the right answer. And this is all bearer independent. I don't care whether you're doing over Bluetooth, 3G, Wi-Fi or whatever. Assume your channel is completely insecure. It is your responsibility as a device to establish a secure session with whatever you're trying to talk to. Don't rely on the communication channel to do any of that. You have to put it over things like Bluetooth or whatever you've given. And yes, there is work to be done to compress the standards, to take the overheads down for building that as you put it onto lower and lower um, capable networks with lower and lower bandwidths, but I do believe you can. But if you give it up on the beginning, you're never going to get it back. So, um, you know, we thought we need to do this. We bought a TLS stack company uh, a few months ago. We looked at it, we looked at our own principles of how we are architecting security. What we'd bought was a fully-fledged TLS stack, but we went, we have to re-architect this, we've cut it up. It's now in three different components because a whole lot of the actual SSL protocol can be run in the application side. You then have to extract out of that some of the raw crypto and say these raw crypto functions have to run in a specially segregated thing that we're calling crypto box in our little secure OS with a micro hypervisor that actually secures that there is you know, complete separation between code execution and data for the things that are running in your crypto box from the rest of the system. And then finally, you need to go and store your certificates and all of that in yet another place that is isolated from any of the above. So what was one monolithic piece of software cut up into three different things, running three different security regimes. And then you can do stuff in your certificates. You can make it so that you, know, you can pre-cache certificates if you want to uh, during your provisioning process. You can make it cheaper to do SSL session reconnections to take down the cost of always coming back and doing those link connections. And you know, the whole client certificates are necessary, in my view, to actually secure individual devices. So then there's a the whole kind of life cycle, um, sorry, lightweight, um, machine to machine from OMA is a whole way of, of describing how do I do provisioning across a value chain, how do I move a device from manufacture through to taking it out of the box, connecting it to a service, updating it, deciding that I then want to take it and remove it from one particular service and add it to another service. There are standards for how to do that. There is then loads of arguments about who has the root of trust. And I think people sometimes get a bit 
carried away with believing they need to own the root of trust because there are lots of different roots of trust and once I get a device, I can always put myself on top of whatever I want. I can reclaim my own root of trust on top of anybody else's. And so there are some people who are, you know, I need to put it on when I do wafer probe because actually I'm the chip manufacturer and I'm trying to do skew management and have one piece of silicon that pretends to be two different chips. And I sell one as being expensive with lots of embedded flash and the other one with cheap with a little embedded flash. In fact, they both have exactly the same amount, but I need to manage that. So I'm going to actually do that provisioning at the wafer level. You may be a smart card manufacturer who says, I'm going to provision, put firmware into my device and package it. And at the packaging, that's when I'm doing provisioning. You may be at the other end, a consumer product that says, when I take it out of the box, first person it talks to owns the device. Right? It, that's a good enough security model for me. But once that person has taken ownership of it, they should actually do provisioning to it. And at the moment, in those Bluetooth examples, was if somebody else comes along to it, they can pair it again. Well, no, because they're the second person who's trying to pair it. The first time round, my identity should now be in that device. I now own that device. And if somebody else tries to come and repair with it, it's not going to let that happen. So it's not as secure as doing it earlier, but for a consumer product, it may be fine. If you're the first person to pair with it, you own it. Now, some security service down the road may have opened the car bar box and you know, there's another story for you. So life cycle management, it is all about roots of trust, but think where you're going to put it and whose root of trust is it and why do you have it? Is it me as the device owner who has that root of trust? Well, actually, there's a second one, which may be the service provider who says, I now trust your device and I will stream data to you. It's a different root of trust for that. And... There's a whole bunch of you know, corporate level software integration to be done to say, how do you manage those devices? How do you manage your networks? How do you view what your you know, anomaly detection is on the network of devices that you care about? So there's a whole bunch of enterprise software which isn't what we put into the, into the open source, unlike the client side, which actually then allows you to manage those, those deployments using, again, a whole bunch of standardization around the certificates and how, how you manage those. So just to finish, I think these are the problems we actually need to solve if you're going to make IoT successful. Need trust for it to scale, but developers don't have that expertise you have to architect systems that let them develop it without them becoming security experts. You need to remove from them the security choices they have to make. And there's good and bad. The, you know, the bad is you're going to take away some choice on what your system architectures and designs are. The good is what's going to get used is going to work. And that's where I believe in the, the homogeneous view of security reduce the number of options and damn well get it right rather than have everyone invent something and know that most of them are actually going to get it wrong. Can't have a flat security model. If you have a flat security model, any hole opens you up and you lose control of your device. You have to have a way of architecting that security model to compartmentalize and divide up what has to iterate quickly and what you're going to work on and validate and push through really slowly. There is no excuse for communication protocols to be compromised. As I say, TLS, just do it. Bear the cost and the, your communication channel then should never be in the plane. You have to get to the root of insecure firmware updates. That needs to be implemented in the device. It needs to be managed on the cloud side for how you actually then control, validate, and revoke those updates. How you stop people doing rollbacks on firmware because, you know, here's my secure device, but I'm going to force a spoofed rollback to an earlier version of the software. You need to manage how all of that works. And you have to get the random number generation right. And we've had lots of talks about it's hard. The stuff you can do in software, but there's things you have to do in hardware to actually maintain those entropy pools because if you don't get your random numbers generators right at the bottom, the whole PKI infrastructure is worthless. You need to get that right. That's it. Thank you.
I don't see anything better. Is it perfect? No. Um, I, I, I think the, the one difference I'd like, or perhaps the only difference I'd like to see in IoT is I'd like to have my certificates on devices. At the moment in the PC world, it's always somebody else's. Right? I want to start with my certificates on there as well. And that, some of that was touched on earlier about privacy, who should see my data, do I send all my data to some third party aggregator? All of those things are only going to be enforceable if you actually get your own certificates into it. And we actually end up having, and it's different between business and consumer, but in the consumer world, the notion of my identity and my ownership or family or how you want to build that put into the device so at, at points in the future I can go you know what I've changed my mind I don't want that to happen but all of the weaknesses in certificate management can't fix that I haven't seen anything better and there's an awful lot of billions of dollars of money and time and effort being spent in trying to make that internet world and from my perspective it's the best we've got let's use it I believe the cost of putting this in is low. And so it becomes, in my world, it should become a cost of doing business. Um, you know, I, I don't want to buy a product that doesn't support this. Um, is sense. The, in, the incremental cost is sense. In time and effort in doing the design, a little bit more. Um, but... While, while, while hardware costs are, are under pressure, I think you have to look at who, who will actually be buying that product. And quite often, you're actually buying the service and the hardware comes for free. And therefore, it's a question of if the service provider does see the value in it, they are effectively subsidizing the hardware, but hopefully they're making enough money on the service side. Um, no, I think I, I, th I think at points there are, there are points in that value chain where, where the value inverts at times and it go it goes against building that in. But I think fundamentally, it's only going it's not going to take very many Barbie incidents or very many more uh, Samsung TV incidents for brand owners to go. I cannot be I cannot afford to be embarrassed. Now, you end up on, on perhaps zero brand consumer products where, where, where you may never change that and a, a 50 cents more on a $10, $10 device may not be achievable. But I think from anyone with a brand, they will go, I'm simply not prepared to tolerate that level of embarrassment. And that's what will drive it. And I think once you've moved a whole chunk of it, then it becomes what you have to do to be in business, and even for the so white label goods, it will be, well, if you don't do that, you're, you're not, you haven't got a good enough copy, copy product. The second side of what happens when somebody knocks on my door and says, Mike, uh, we'd like all the root keys, please. Um, who knows? Whether there'll be regulation, I mean, there's been attempts to regulate kind of, you can't do encryption, right? the whole strong crypto export standards. So there have been various government moves to sort of prevent crypto from happening in the first place. But I think we're through that. Um, will there be legislation to say you may not encrypt any data you send over the internet? I don't think so. Ultimately, the consumer pays. Uh, my hope is it becomes infeasible to build a product that isn't secure by design. Absolutely not. However much you try, it will be easy to build appalling systems. But I think we have to make it a lot easier than it is today. There will then be products out there that are badly designed, carelessly designed. 
well-intentionally misdesigned, um, we're not going to stop it happening. I, I, I think there's an alignment. I think there's a big problem between um, the horizontal, broad nature of IoT and I could have you know, the cheap... USB charger plugged into my wall socket that I bought for $1.99 that is much more likely to burn down my house than, than, than somebody's going to hack my phone, my kettle to set it off when there's no water in it. So, so, so I, I think there's a challenge, but I do think it'll start um, in a vertical fashion in that there are insurers today with Drive Like a Girl who'll put this box in my car to monitor how I'm driving then how do you know that I haven't hacked that and taken random positioning and turns down? The, so, 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 so I think there are specific instances where insurance or financial service is tied to identifiable product where they'll say, if I'm going to give you insurance for this, I require that device to be a higher level of security. So I think it'll start in some verticals. There's, you know, healthcare, some security devices, uh, um, things where, as I say, it's tied to particular devices. I think it'll be a long time before your insurer gets to the point that says, I'll reduce your insurance by, what, about 12p because you claim you've got five lever mortise locks on all your doors, which is sort of the other end. <laughs>